Good morning. Today is the 15th day of uh, October in this 20, 24th year of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beautiful day outside, clear skies, cool temperatures in the 60s, uh, just bright sun coming up, and uh, we're thankful for the blessings of fall. Beautiful time of the year. Hope uh, it's uh, nice for you. We don't get a whole lot of color down here. Our trees are perhaps mostly deciduous, um, are uh, pine and uh, evergreens. Uh, we do have a little bit of color, uh, which will come later than most of you. So enjoy that and uh, have a blessed day. Um, you can see here I got a haircut last night from uh, barber uh, Wendy Schulman. I'm thankful for her and her talent. Uh, this will get me through another month or two, and uh, then we'll get it a little bit longer for my winter cut, and uh, it's all good. Uh, today, let's begin with a reading from Matthew in the 18th chapter. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened round your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, <laughs> cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire, into the hell of uh, into the hell of fire. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we call that good news. Interesting, and reflect on that this day. A reading reflection comes from C.S. Lewis in the Joyful Christian. Um, great theologian uh, during the time of uh, war, World War II in particular. And uh, here he addresses the topic of theology. Everyone has warned me not to tell you what I'm going to tell you. They all say the ordinary reader does not want theology. Get in plain practical religion. I have rejected their advice. I do not think the ordinary reader is such a fool. Theology means the science of God. And I think any man who wants to think about God at all would like to have the clearest and most accurate ideas about him which are available. You are not children. Why should you be treated like children? In a way, I quite understand why some people are put off by theology. I remember once when I had been given, uh, giving a talk to the RAF, uh, an old hard-bitten officer got up and said, I have no use for all this, that stuff, but mind you, I am a religious man too. I know there's a God. I've felt him out alone in the desert at night, the tremendous mystery, and that's just why I don't believe all your neat little dogmas and formulas about him. Try anyone who's met the real thing. They all seem so petty and pedantic and unreal. Now, in a sense, I quite agree with that man. I think he is probably a real experience of God in the desert. And when he turned from that experience to the Christian creeds, I think he really was turning from something real to something less real. In the same way, if a man has once looked at the Atlantic from a beach and then goes and looks at a map of the Atlantic, 
he also will be turning from real waves to a bit of colored paper. And here comes the point. The map is admittedly only colored paper. But there are two things you have to remember about it. In the first place, it's based on what hundreds and thousands of people have found out by sailing the real Atlantic. In that way, it has behind it masses of experiences just as real as the one you could have from the beach, only while yours would be a single isolated glimpse. The map fixes all of those different experiences together. In the second place, if you want to go anywhere, the map is absolutely necessary. As long as you are content with walks on the beach, your own glimpses are far more fun than looking at a map. But the map is going to be more use than walks on the beach if you want to get to America. Now, theology is like the map. Merely learning and thinking about the Christian doctrines, if you stop there, is less real and less exciting than the sort of things my friend got in the desert. Doctrines are not God. They are only a kind of map. But the map is based on the experience of hundreds of people who really were in touch with God, experiences compared with which any thrill or pious feeling you and I are likely to get on our own way to very elemental and very confused, are very elemental and confused. And secondly, if you want to get any further, you must use the map. You see, what happened to that man in the desert may have been real and was certainly exciting, but nothing comes of it. It leads nowhere. There is nothing to do about it. In fact, that is just why a vague religion, all about feeling God in nature and so on, is so attractive. It's all thrills and no work, but watching the waves from the beach. But you will not get to Newfoundland by studying the Atlantic that way, and you will not get eternal life by simply feeling the presence of God in flowers or in music. Neither will you get anywhere by looking at maps without going to sea, nor will you be very safe if you go to sea without a map. Very practical and common sense words from C.S. Lewis, a man who is well acquainted with God, God's experience, and he embraced theology as that very map that shows us the fullness of God. The gospel records, the epistles of Paul and of Peter, of James, of John, and others are a record of their life experiences that show us the true reality and meaning behind that simple experience in God in the desert, in the country, Theology is placed in the midst of community, and thus the importance of something that was created by Christ, the fellowship of believers, we call that the church. It's the combined experience of people shared to reinforce that one simple personal experience that we may have about the presence of God in our midst. And so, my friends, don't reject theology, but embrace it as a learning experience, as a roadmap, as further growth in that wonderful personal experience that you already have of God, and it will be so much more enriched. You'll find the full flavor of what God is. You'll find the pathways that God wishes you to travel and to embrace not just your own personal experience of a joy in your heart or that good feeling you may get or the awe of the wonder of nature that all of us can experience, but what the real hard work of a relationship with God is about. So embrace theology, learn from God. It's all rooted in the scripture. 
you don't need to read the tombs of the greats of theology, the Telic and uh, the Luthers and others who have enfleshed their own experience of that gospel, of that word, and put it into a road map that they have followed. But you can read the scripture and discern from that the pathway that God is leading you upon to a life that is full and complete. And let us pray. Lord, I thank you for the blessings of life and this beautiful day you have gifted us with. We pray your guiding principles and presence will be with us. We pray that we might experience you in many and varied ways to confirm the reality of the truth that is God. We thank you for those who have walked with you and experienced the fullness of your grace, your mercy, your judgment, your conviction, your righteousness, and the hope that you have revealed through your word. Help us to do the same, to dig deeper into those personal experiences and embrace the fullness of who you are and what you would have us to be. Guide us, O Lord, upon the pathways of life this day, and let us be good and true reflections of your love for this world. Bring your love to bear in the hearts and minds of all of those who go to war over matters that are insignificant but seem so very significant to them, over revenge and hatred, over the indifference toward the neighbor in need, over greed and avarice. We pray for the peoples of Ukraine, the people of Russia that would invade them, return their lands and bring peace to the peoples of Gaza, whom a small element within wreaked havoc upon the Israel Israelis and brought a heart of vengeance upon them. But we pray for all of those innocents caught in the midst that suffer gravely at the destruction of their land, bring peace and resolve there. We pray, O oh Lord, for each that we intercede for this day, for Charlotte, for Gail, for Donna, for Jenny, Linda, for Miriam and Elaine, for Tom and Nikki, for Kenneth and Gay, for Barry, for Evelyn Ragg and Evelyn Tompkins and James, for Mark and Katie, for Laura, and for all others we commend to your loving care, for Regine, who's in the hospital, bring her health and healing, and embrace us all in your loving arms of mercy. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you, to be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor, giving you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord this day and forevermore. Amen.